then you get married and then you start seeing things and it's like, oh, well, it's too late. Guess I have to make this work because divorce is wrong because the Bible tells me so. And I don't want to shame my family and I don't want the church to turn their back on me. You know, and Jesus makes everything okay. And he didn't. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Epic Kate Show. This podcast conversation is with an amazing woman named Dawn. She escaped a manipulative, emotionally abusive marriage with a narcissistic man and her story of getting free, finding that strength within herself and escaping with her nine children is powerful. I'm really glad to be here and I've actually been dreaming of an opportunity like this Mm -hmm. to be able to share my story. I've shared it with close friends, family, of course, because they walked with me through it. Um, But on a bigger stage, I haven't been able to do it and I'm hoping this will help somebody. And it's also healing for me. I've been writing like crazy and I probably have way too much to share in one podcast, but that's okay. Cause it's really helped me. I'm trying to write a book about it too. So yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So, and Hey, yeah. if you, if you re- really want to, we can, we can do this again. We, we can get through more of the story later. Um, but jumping into it, you said that you came from a very strict religious upbringing. How strict was it? Well, I would say It was very strict in some ways and not so strict in others. So uh, what I ended up being, and I don't want to jump ahead too far, Hmm. but I I did get to go to public school. I mean, homeschool was not a thing back in the the 80s too much. There were some people doing it, but you hardly ever heard of it. So I grew up in the 70s and 80s. We went to school. um, But of course, my parents, they... They were Christians, they were concerned for our souls, and, you know, they were doing what they thought was the best thing to uh, help all of us make good decisions and live a good life, and and so I don't fault them for that, but yeah, there were certain things that, there music that I really shouldn't listen to, that kind of thing, um, any any music that I did get to listen to as far as rock music, I would sneak it. So like when my folks would leave, my brother would jack up Queen as as high as the stereo would go. And that was fun. (laughs) I mean, I loved a lot of music. Um, Of course, my parents, uh, they love music, but you know, their genre was, they loved the thirties and forties. They were teenagers in the fifties. And that was their their time. And classical was a huge part of our upbringing, uh, Broadway music. Mm. So, and both of my parents sang. So it was- And the a, music, a, sorry, the, the, the music shifted quite a bit going into the Jesus movement, didn't it? Oh, it sure did. And that's a nice segue. <laughs> yeah, you, you were asking me the other day about the Jesus movement and I was young. Uh, very young. In fact, I was born like in the middle of it, but I remember the the revival meetings, the conferences. Uh, you know, my dad, I don't want to make this too much about him, although he's a lot of my life, but he, when he was a kid, his grandma dragged him to church, baptized him at 15. He didn't really understand it. But then when I came along, it started to become uh I guess more important, my mom was raised in the church by her mother and my, I, you know, maybe to be a very nice husband to her, maybe that's why he went too, but he really got into it. And that's the thing about my dad was he was either all in or all out. And I so, caught that too. So. so what did that look like being all in, in the Jesus movement? Like what was the atmosphere? What are some fe- impressions that you have of it? Uh, everything, everything was about Jesus, everything. So, I mean, from, you know, the, the praying for, for healing, you know, we would have somebody come over and anoint us with oil if we were sick or, um, we never got into the praying in tongues of the Pentecostal movement. Um, that was one thing my dad didn't like, didn't agree with, didn't think it was, he would say it wasn't biblical, (laughs) um, because we, we saw that being done overly. Uh, I mean, to the extreme. And so we didn't go that far, but everything we did was about God. And we were at church as much as possible. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
we went to a lot of different churches. Some in the church could say, oh, you guys were church hoppers. But as I talked over the years with my mom about the different churches, and I could rattle them all off to you, which I won't, but there were real reasons that we went to certain ones. And it was usually, uh, my dad would make the decision, is there enough for the kids? Um, is the music uplifting enough? Because like I said, music was a huge part uh, one church we left because he got a job at another church. Uh, he had no seminary training, but something about my dad, this pastor saw and thought, oh, he's a people person, which he was. Um, and he was director of evangelism, director of youth. Mm -hmm. and so you were, you that. were just deep in the pastor's oh, kid, yeah. kind of lots of oh, heavy oh, expectations yeah. on you. Yeah, and I would say there were three of us kids, and I have an older brother and sister. We don't talk, and it's oh, no. nothing to do with, you know, what I've gone through and how I've come out of religion. It's just we've never been close, and I always felt bad, but um, looking back, you know, I can't say for what was going on in their, their heads, but I was seen as the one that did all the right things and I was the real compassionate, loving uh, kid, obeyed my parents, tried to please them as much as possible. And so, yeah, so that was kind of hard because I felt the, like the favored one in their eyes, but my parents had no intention of that. So it just kind of happened. <laughs> so you so you didn't rebel. You didn't have this, oh, I'm so sick at church all the time. Nope, not at all. I couldn't wait to be there. But I will say, I have it written down somewhere, but it's in my head. Um, yeah. I did have a lot of doubts at the same time. I mean, I, I never liked the story of Adam and Eve, never liked it. I accepted it because we were supposed to as good Christians, you know. Um, I didn't like the idea of the fact that God supposedly made these angels and one of them turned against him. I, I just thought it was awful the story that God actually placed temptation in, in their way or like right in front of them. And like, he knew they'd fall. And, but I was always told, oh, but he had a plan. And that was to show his love. Cause if that hadn't happened, then Jesus wouldn't have had to die. I'm like, I just didn't like it. But again, you don't question. Because yeah. Because in that culture, you just, you just nod your head and you just go along with everything. Exactly. Well, the alternative is we're told if you don't believe this, you're going to go to hell. And so even though, oh yeah, even though, you know, I know all the verses, therefore there, there's no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. And I know, you know, we're not saved by uh, works, but by faith, but you can't just cherry pick the verses because there's a lot of other garbage in the Bible that we were, I knew it was there. But we either ignored it or we made an excuse for why it was there. So, so do you just make a huge jump over into your life? Um, do you think that it was really connected this, these, the way that you were raised to push down your doubts? Do you think that those were huge contributing factors to leading you to a marriage that wasn't what a marriage should be? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, there's so much I could say. Uh, one is I ended up in a relationship that mirrored what really Christianity represented, you know, mm. oh, I love you if you do this, this, and this. And that's what I heard from Christianity was, you know, God's unconditional with his love. And yet if you don't love him back and rub his ego, you're going to go to hell. And that kind of carried into the relationship. And uh, I don't want to go too far back again, but I ended up at a Christian college and I got more and more, I would say that would be my rebellious stage was in college and it was a Bible college. Uh, I had gone with the intention of becoming a missionary. That was my my goal, we were in the CM and, uh, CNMA, the Christian Missionary Alliance, and their big, big push is for missionaries. And, uh, you know, I felt there was so much emphasis on a calling, especially that, that was a higher calling than anything else. And so I 
was very upset when I got to the school and there were some good people. In fact, some of my favorite people were the, the professors, but there was so much push towards this high calling and missions and all that, that they forgot that we're just supposed to be good people helping those around us. And there was a lot of hypocrisy. Uh, my very first semester in school, a friend of mine from Puerto Rico, long story short, let's just say she got raped, became pregnant, they kicked her out of college. And that was a Christian college. That's the love of Jesus. And that kind of thing happened a lot, maybe not to that extreme, but there was just, I mean, things like Sundays, everything was closed down. You could not go to the library on campus to work on your homework, but they could have a restaurant open to make money for the school. So, I mean, just, just little things. I'm nitpicking a lot. I mean, there's, there's a lot more. Um, but then I, second year in college, I changed my major to music because that really was ultimately what I should have done from the beginning. Um, still wanted to use my music for God, but I really wanted to go into music. And I met somebody and we became really good friends, really great guy. In fact, we still talk to this day. Um, but we got into our relationship so fast and it was so serious. I never really dated in high school. I mean, I had dates, but I was always told, you know, you don't want to let that get in the way of college. You don't want to let it get in the way of God. And I really didn't know that you could just date and have fun. And, you know, I don't know if that makes any sense. So when I got into a serious relationship and it went fast, we were already talking marriage and I got very scared and he didn't return to school the next year. So of course the doubts crept in and it was within two months, I was on a break in Florida and I met the ex and he was charming. And, you know, it was exciting to meet somebody that was, he was in the military, he was from the West coast. And I was just, what do we say, Twitter pated. Um, and I look back and I think, Ugh, I should have seen so many red flags and I didn't see it because I was so scared of being alone. I wanted to be loved. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of reasons why we do the things we do. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. But, it and just... it was a long distance relationship. I should tell you that. So I didn't, there were some red flags I would see when we would visit each other but it was impossible to see everything. And then you get married and then you start seeing things and it's like, oh, well, it's too late. Guess I have to make this work because divorce is wrong because the Bible tells me so. And I don't want to shame my family and I don't want the church to turn their back on me, you know, and Jesus makes everything okay. And he didn't. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. If you just pray hard enough, if you just believe they will change. Yeah. Yeah. And I kept thinking it was my fault because I was told it was, I mean, that's, that's in the church culture that it's the woman's job to not only dress modestly and make sure you don't let your other brothers stumble. You got to make sure that husband of yours is very happy in every way that you can imagine. And then he won't stray. Um, and I mean, I found myself in a situation I had no voice. And so I knew I was in trouble and yet I thought, no, it's gonna work out. And he went out to see a lot. And when he came back, I thought, okay, we're gonna make this work. We're gonna have a child, huh, bad idea. So um, I love my children. I always say that. I mean, I've got all these kids, which that'll come out in a few minutes. But after my first was born, I knew I was in huge trouble because one morning, I think she was three weeks old. And I had a very difficult birth with her, still healing. We had just moved from Virginia back to Ohio. And I woke up and he woke up next to me and I have this kid. And I'm trying to figure out how to nurse her and all those things. And I'm exhausted. And he's like, I just feel like I have a roommate. You just don't pay attention to me. And, and we're not having, he didn't say this, but relations three weeks since I had this child, you know, I'm still healing from an episiotomy and all the other things. And, and the women out there know what that is. 
And I didn't understand that I was getting depressed and didn't know I could ask for help, you know. So that's when I knew. And I just thought, well, it's it's over. I have to make it work. And, you know, I trudged through for all these years, but I kept having children because he didn't want to do birth control, didn't want to use birth control. And every time I would get upset, it was, what was it? My seventh child. And I found out when I was pregnant with her, I got very depressed. And all I heard from him was, oh, the Lord will provide. I don't know if you know that verse, my God shall supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And that he would quote that to me. Of course, I would say it over and over in my head, like a mantra, trying to convince myself. But I mean, I just kept hearing, well, you got to trust God more and I'll take care of you. He'd say that. And in the midst of it, no, he didn't take care of me. We were in monstrous debt because he was a spender. Um, oh, he's a gun guy. So he would buy a ton of guns and ammo when we should be paying for our bills and those things. Um, anytime I wanted the kids to be able to do something, uh, you know, he would either say, no, we can't do that. Or he would just give me oh, hell basically anytime like my my oldest is a pianist and he would complain about her lessons you know or well, I don't want anybody else teaching these kids but us which really meant me because he never helped with homeschooling either so yeah oh we would go to the homeschool conferences together because he could parade all of his little darlings there um but then we'd come home and I was alone again so yeah, and I, you know, to be fair, I wanted to homeschool the kids from the beginning, but I had no idea I would end up with that many kids and not have a voice and not have help. So, yeah. I want to ask a question, but maybe it's a bit too intimate, but I want to make a wild guess that you probably didn't get much of anything in terms of sex education before getting married. Oh, you know, books. <laughs> I took a marriage and family class in college and we had to read a specific book, well, of our choosing from a list. And I read the Tim LaHaye book. Oh it's gosh. Awful. It's awful. Oh. I mean, I felt, I felt terrible. And yeah, so, I mean, I knew how everything worked, but I didn't, realize that you know where what I was in uh, and, and I would say steep patriarchy that I had no voice in so. none of these books there's only one book that I know of that was written a few years ago the great sex rescue by oh, Sheila Gray Ray, Ray, Ray Gregoire I hope to have her on this channel too um she's the only one that's like taught gone into consent no other marriage book has gone into if it's not an enthusiastic yes, it's a no. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Because I don't really remember many times that I really consented. Oh. Because most of the time it was to keep the peace. I mean, I forgot which baby it was. I, in fact, if your viewers don't know, I have nine children. Um, but one of the babies afterwards, I would hear, well, it's just not healthy for me not to get enough sex, you know, um, or right after a baby was born, you know, my midwife would say, Hey, you know, nothing for at least six weeks. And those six weeks were grueling because you'd think I would get a break. Oh no. I had to do other things for him. And I'll never forget. He had an office in the basement of our house and we had a babysitter that would come over once a week to give me a little bit of a break. She'd wash dishes and old clothes, let me take a couple kids, you know, down for piano lessons or something. Um, I loved her. But one time he was, oh, he was working at home by then. So he is in his office and he expected that act while she was upstairs with my children. And to say no, I was scared to death. I, I mean, somebody could say, oh, he would never hurt you. It didn't matter. The fact that he was threatening, he had me crying one time because he said, you've just got to try harder. Will you promise to try harder? And one thing he would ask a lot 
And that's why I kind of go back and forth with the Christianity thing too. It really mirrored it. He kept saying, do you trust me? And to say I didn't would be bad, but it sounded so much like God, do you trust me? No, I don't, you know, <laughs> but I couldn't say it. So, and I didn't know enough to go and ask for help. Um, I mean, you had, I forgot her name. She was so precious uh, last week that had struggled with postpartum depression. Oh, yeah. I did too, but there was no, I had no idea how to get to a, a professional. I mean, my doctor was my midwife. That was it. We had no health insurance. Um, we just didn't go to the doctor. So yeah, it was, so I don't really have an actual diagnosis, but I know if it wasn't postpartum, it was sure awful darn close. So yeah. So when did these things pile up to the point that you just recognized this, this is not, I, I don't deserve this. Huh. Uh, let's see many times, but mm -hmm. I guess last time that it, it held was the summer of 2016. And I would say, I remember the morning we had a little four acre farm. My, my daughter took care of the animals. And I was trying so hard. I'd just gotten my last baby down to, to take a nap. And I wanted to go out, weed the gardens, that kind of thing, have a break. And he was still in bed. And as I walked uh, away out of the bedroom, because I just got all my, you know, my garden stuff on, he grabbed my wrist and he's like, well, you got to come back to bed. I'm like, no, I don't. And we had a huge fight because of that. And he left in, in, a, in a huff. But that led to, you know, over the weeks, I said, I'm done. I am so done. So mm -hmm. I didn't know how I was going to get out at that point, but I knew I was done and I had to start getting my ducks in a row. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's really, it feels special somehow to be able to call out a, a specific fight, a specific moment of knowing that, that you, you did have that strength that that was there and yeah. that that decision was made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a grueling, I would say from, I would say from May of that year until the following January when I got out with the kids, it was so grueling to be sharing a house with him. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, to get a lawyer, I didn't have any money. Uh, and, and all the other things I had to do, um, I did get help. My folks helped. I had a very, very good friend from church, but from our childhood church back when we were 10 years old, she, uh, she saw what was going on a long time ago. And she and her family helped me get out. And um, she said, hey, as soon as you can figure it out, we have a house for you. Um, so yeah, they had no kids. They just have this huge house. And uh, so I was able to get a lawyer and my lawyer, I, you know, I don't like lawyers. I'll just say that right now. And I don't agree with everything she did, but she was advising me the best that she knew how to deal with an absolute lunatic. And she said, well, you can't file a divorce and stay at that house. It would be dangerous. And I, I agreed with her and, you know, maybe he wouldn't hit me. But mentally, I couldn't take one more second with him. And so we knew he was going to be out of town for the day. I was trying to remember if he left the night before. I can't remember now. Some things I've blocked out. Um, but anyway, my daughter and I had been packing for months, literally. And at that point, I was sleeping in my daughter, my oldest two daughters' room with the baby. We had a little crib beside me. And um, so we were hiding things out. and. He left and my friend and her husband came up with their car. We packed their car, two of our cars, and, uh, and the ex still had his gorgeous car. So he always had really nice cars. Um, of course he did. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, by the way, narcissism is narcissistic to a T, but that's another discussion. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we left and as we left, my lawyer had said, okay, I want you to calculate exactly how much is in the bank account and what is half and take half. 
That way you guys have something to live on and you're not taking everything. Leave a note for them. You know, don't tell them where you are. Just tell them we're, we're fine. We need time away. And she also said, because she knew we had a credit card, she said, you need to get a cash advance out to put in a, in a fund for emergencies. Mm -hmm. So I did. Of course, months later, that came out as I stole money from him and all this stuff. There was no other way to have any money. None. I mean, I didn't have a job outside of the home. I was a vocalist that wasn't allowed to go sing and make money. I, he didn't want me working for another man. You know, nothing. So years and years of being a mom, a homeschool mom, and an owned wife, I'll just say it that way. Um, so yeah, there was no money. And so we did that. But by late afternoon, he was still out of town. And he must have gotten alerted that the credit card had something had happened with the credit card. So he started calling and texting me over and over and over and over again. And I didn't answer, just didn't answer at all. And we just kept driving. So do you remember that feeling of pulling away from the house? <sighs> yeah. Yeah. We were scared, excited. Uh, kind of triumphant. Um, I don't, I don't know if you know Jody Messina. She's a country singer, but there's a song she sings. It's called Bye Bye. And my daughter and I kept thinking, oh, that's it. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but again, it was still, we weren't sure what was going to happen because at that point I was hoping I could come back to the house. I could live there and it didn't end up being that way. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there was so many things ahead that I had no idea. I'm kind of glad I didn't know what was coming. Um, but I imagine it must have been a little rough with so many little ones too. Of like, it's just a game. Like, be quiet. Don't talk about it. Don't tell dad about the about the boxes. Yeah. Well, honestly, nobody knew except my oldest daughter, and then my uh, third child. She knew. I should say he, and that's another story, but um, Atlas, she knew something was coming, but didn't know. She knew we were going to go somewhere, but didn't know how long and what the situation was. So none of the kids knew I had filed for divorce except for my oldest. And uh, she was probably just, your oh, rock in that time, huh? Oh my goodness. How old was yeah. she? Uh, 18. Okay. Yeah. Just turned 18. Yeah. And that's another discussion. I mean, she went through a ton, a ton of grief from her father at the time. So um, but I, just, bet she, I bet she is so proud of you. I bet they all are once they're old enough to know the for the littlest ones, once they're old enough to know, they're going to just know yeah. that you were brave and you right. did you, you did your best. Right. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I had to deal with some of the younger ones kind of wondering because they we missed some birthdays at the house. We, you know, we were away. Uh, and I think a couple of them who are still, sometimes they feel bad for their father. Um, and I'm not going to take that from them. You know, if that's what they are going to do, that's fine. Um, but I had to try to ease into, you know, this is the way it's got to be right now. And uh, it was tough. It was tough when I finally had to tell the kids that, that I was, divorcing him so and but, then uh, your churches just completely oh. turned their backs on you yeah oh yeah Big time. I mean I got a horrible letter from a woman that had been I thought a close friend of mine and this was the summer um before I left and what I have left out not on purpose because there's so much to talk about but my husband now has been a friend of mine since high school. And he was walking with me through the whole thing. Of course, we developed more of a friendship. We, we not friendship, we were friends and we developed more of a romantic relationship, but it wasn't on purpose. I mean, to this day, I'm sure I'm talked about, oh, she left for another man. No, no. Honestly, if my husband, he had already said, you know, if we don't get together, it's okay. I just want to see you out of there. And uh, so, but this letter from this friend uh, was terrible.
because she knew about Rich. And so it was just very, very, um, oh, I can't even think, condemning, very condemning. And, you know, through all of this, nobody, all the years, nobody saw, hey, you know, Dawn might need some help. She's having trouble. There's something wrong with that relationship. Nobody, you know. So, and people that did see it, um, well, I know one couple who I'm really close to now, they left this one church years ago and they saw it. But what could they do? Being in the, Christ the church, being a Christian, you don't want to encourage a woman to leave her husband. So, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's just going back to the way you're raised to be looking out for a big call is that the callings is emphasized over the people and anybody who gets hurt is just collateral damage. And it's like, it doesn't yeah. matter if you're wash, washing dishes, cleaning toilets, anyone can do that. It's the people above. Those are the important ones, the, the yeah. evangelists, the, yeah. the missionaries and in the family structure, the only calling is to just submit to the man. And in the in the woman is just the collateral damage. Yeah. The kept the kept wife. Like yeah. I oh um is there anything else that you wanted to say about about the escape or about the response from the churches? Oh no, no, <laughs> I don't want to. Do <laughs> well, it's funny because I had to finally give up the feeling of I have to speak up for myself and tell these churches that, you know, I needed help. You weren't there for me. I, you know, they need to see my side. And I finally realized it doesn't matter. Even if they saw my side, I am convinced they wouldn't help. Mm. And so it's, I don't want to give them extra attention. You know, I just, I, I realized they weren't my friends. Because and, the uh, people who deserve attention are the people out there that are still trapped. Yes, exactly. And it's all, all over. It's all over. And, and especially in the churches. I mean, you've got domestic abuse everywhere, but people just turn a, a, a deaf ear to what's going on in the church families. So. And I hate, hate, hate how they only acknowledge physical abuse. Yeah. Or, oh, or yeah. even, or even not even that, like, as long as you can hide it, it's okay. Like oh, emotional yeah. abuse being, being harassed into sex. That is mm -hmm. abuse. You didn't mm -hmm. break the marriage by divorcing him. He broke it by being a horrible excuse for a person, a human stain. Okay. You know, <laughs> oh, yeah. well, but, I mean, I said the word owned earlier. I really <gasps> felt owned. I did not feel married anymore at all. I just, just felt like I was a, one of the women in war that they would take as a prisoner. I mean, that's how I felt. And, and, you know, he was getting scarier and scarier and with narcissists, they're jealous anyway, very, very jealous. So you can imagine how jealous he got when he realized that there was somebody there that was helping me. And, you know, he was, you know, messed with his ego and going to take his property. <laughs> of course, Rich wasn't going to take anything. And he never saw me as property, still doesn't. And uh, I mean, and that's a whole nother story. He's amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. for a man to take on a woman with this much baggage and nine children, I, there's not too many guys out there like that. Maybe, maybe I just haven't seen them. So, mm -hmm. um, but I'm finally, I'm getting to a place that, I mean, I still get triggered. And honestly, I think trigger is a word that we use too much, but it's the only way to describe. There are things that still trigger me. Uh, I'll still have memories or something. Uh, Rich does all the communicating with the ex because I was told by many counselors, you are not to. No matter, <laughs> that was my cat. Sorry. <laughs> um, but my uh, counselors, and I'm trying to think who else I was going to say, but they all said, you cannot, oh, the court, the court wanted us to communicate through this 
online thing where we message each other back and forth and you have to pay for it on top of that. It was expensive. And I thought, no, because when he writes things, he's even worse because he writes books and very smoothly. And, you know, for a while, the court could see what he was writing and you knew he wasn't writing to me. He was writing to look good at the court. So anyway, we just said, forget it. And we're, we aren't doing that anymore. But, you know, Rich has to deal with him sometimes a weekly basis, sometimes when there's a real occurrence going on, it's daily. Um, we had something just last week. He was trying to get the kids when it wasn't his time to get them. And we just said, no, no, no. And you just can't say no to this guy. But sorry, we're going to say no. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. That's yeah. actually a really good segue into what I wanted to say. Ask. Um, I, I mentioned this earlier. I want you to do the thing where you look at the camera. What would you say to the person, to the, to the mom who is still stuck? Let me find my notes. <laughs> I'll, I'll I, allow it. I, I wrote some things down and I hope. Yeah, you can just read it. That's totally great. I guess I could. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go for it. So for the woman, uh, that is stuck in a situation like this right now. If you have a trusted friend, friends, some kind of community or family member, reach out and don't be afraid to talk to somebody. I know that like in my situation, it took me years to be able to do it. So please reach out to someone. Um, know that it's not your fault. <laughs> uh, that was a huge one because I used to write in my diary during the whole, uh, before I divorced that, oh, if I could just be a better wife. No, it's not your fault. So um, take some time for yourself, I wrote down. Uh, read as much as you can. Uh, there's a, if I could find it, a wonderful book by, ah, here it is, Lundy Bancroft called Why Does He Do That? That helped me a lot to read as much as I could. Um, the internet is fantastic. I, I am to this day, if it hadn't been for Facebook, I probably wouldn't have gotten out. Mm -hmm. So it was just the connections I made on Facebook. I belonged to a, a bunch of groups and then just friends. I mean, uh, people, not just rich, but tons of friends from high school, even college, even the little Christian college, um, people that have been there for me during the whole process. Um, keep a journal. That's a big one. That's a very big one. Um, and, oh, do, do some things that you've always wanted to do. I mean, of course, we don't have a lot of money. So when I say that this past summer, I love lighthouses and there's a lighthouse in Ohio that I've been to many times, but I've never climbed it because I'm scared to death of heights. And this summer, Rich and I went up all the winding stairs <laughs> And I was very scared at the top, but I did it. And I felt like, hey, you know, it's just to somebody that might be a really little thing, but that was huge for me. Um, and then find ways to help other people. Uh, you know, there's always somebody, an elderly person or somebody that might need help with their kids if you have that kind of time. Um, I mean, for me, I'm a musician. So I've been planning a recital as a uh, uh, fundraiser for a domestic abuse shelter here in Ohio. So I'm doing things like that. But again, when you're in the thick of it, there's some things you just can't do, but those are things that will open up. So, yeah. Yeah, like that's, that's, that's enough. <laughs> no, that's a great encouragement. Like knowing that these things that seem impossible now, they won't be impossible forever. Like, if you saw what if, if you saw what was happening to you happening to someone else that you loved, you would want to help them get out. Yeah, you deserve yeah. to be treated as well as anyone else you care about. Right. Well, there was something in the church I heard a lot when there would be uh, you know sermons about marriage or marriage conferences, horrible things. Um, but one would be, well, he, it's your goal in marriage is not to be happy. Okay. I kind of understand their premise that, you know, marriage is hard and you have to make a choice, some hard choices when, you know, times get tough. But if you're never happy, 
there's a problem. We're supposed yeah. to enjoy this life. This is, I mean, this is going to go into something else, but we're, this is all we've got. So we've got all these Christians packing their bags. They can't wait for the rapture. Can't wait to go to heaven and all this stuff. You're supposed to enjoy life, even with all the, the hills and the valleys and all the bad things happening. There are wonderful things. And so it's okay. We're supposed to be happy. And I was miserable. Yeah. So. For people who still hold on to faith, just like I have another conversation with a woman who's gone through a horribly abusive marriage as well. Um, she stills managed to hold on to her faith and she, her heart cries that Jesus, God is weeping for the pain that you've gone through. And if you're not religious, that's not for you. But if you are, then I hope you can take that to heart. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'll be the first to say, because I, you know, I was in it so deeply that, you know, Jesus was everything to me. Um, I would never, even though I've come out of all of it and left, I would never tell somebody you should, you shouldn't be a Christian or you shouldn't do any of that. That's just silly because if that's, what's getting you through and that's what you really feel, go for it as long as you're not using it to abuse others and you know or allow yourself to be abused <laughs> that's really yeah, yeah yeah that's more what i meant to say but yeah, yeah. so yeah is there anything <laughs> else that you'd like to say i don't know is there anything else anybody wants to know I mean, yeah, you can put your call. If anybody ha watches this and has any questions, you can put them down in the comments. You can reach out to us individually on Facebook. I just hope that this video will reach who it's meant to reach and just know you're not alone and just know that your voice matters and your story matters. And I said, I started, I said it when we started, you are so brave to share it. And I'll say it again, you're very brave and I'm so happy that you have a happy life now with someone that you can trust. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's never easy, but life isn't. It's just nice to go through it with somebody that's not pushing against me. Yeah. 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 So, oh, one more thing. There is a song by Rachel Platten, pop singer here in America. And I, I love the song. In fact, my one friend, that I talk to a lot, it's her ringtone when I call her. So it's called Fight Song. And the words are amazing. This is my fight song, take back my life song, prove I'm all right song, my power's turned on, starting right now I'll be strong, I'll play my fight song. And I don't really care if nobody else believes. And then the last line, um because i've still got a lot a lot of fight left in me and that's one of my songs <laughs> so awesome yeah. i gotta listen to that yeah <laughs> well yeah. thank you um the way that i end my conversations is i give hugs oh here's one back <laughs> hugs, hugs oh. to you hugs to to you watching this thank you for being here thank you for listening to this conversation and i hope that you feel encouraged thank you very very much thank you bye. bye there is a lot more to her story with difficult pregnancy pregnancy losses that we didn't get into here but if you have any questions for her share them in the comments and we can include them in a part two Thank you so much for taking the time to listen and grow in compassion as you learn with me. Hugs! <laughs>